All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is Pi Data Hamburg. Welcome to our November meetup, the last one for this year. But you can be sure there will be another year and uh, new Pi Data meetups. We are aiming for one every two months and already in the process of organizing. Um, before we start, um, you should know that we are from now on recording the session and we're going to put, a, put it on the PyData YouTube channel. Um, we encourage you to act actively participate. You can unmute yourself. You can show yourself on the camera. Just know that we can't cut this out. So if you don't want to show your picture or your voice on the internet, you can always use the chat to ask questions and communicate with us. Um, I think it's not a problem if you just unmute yourself and uh, start talking, but you can also raise your hand here in Zoom so we know that you want to ask a question later and we're going to collect the questions. So is, is there anyone here who's completely new to PyData? Uh, usually people are familiar, but if you're joining us for the first time, this may be your first PyData event. Uh, PyData is a global community for developers and users of open source data tools. And it's an educational program of the LUM Focus organization from the United States. All the PyData chapters, they're decentralized, they're self-organized. And uh, this is the meetup of the Hamburg uh, chapter. We uh, communicate with you through our Twitter, uh, PyData Hamburg. We have a LinkedIn page. You can find our recordings on YouTube under the PyData TV channel. And my name is Christian. I'm a freelance data scientist. And it's my pleasure to host this tonight together with Maria, Maria Moreno de Castro, a data scientist from the German Climate Computing Center. Maria, say hi to everyone. Yeah. Hi, hi. Thank you for joining. Uh, also, shout out to the rest of the organizing team. That's Camilla and Yuming, who helped us preparing their meetups and uh, they're very, very active in speaker outreach. Yeah, I want to start off um, before we get to the talks with a call for participation. PyData is completely volunteer driven. Uh, certainly our chapter is. Uh, like usual in open source. So we're not a closed group. We want to encourage you, if you feel like getting active in the community, to join us. And there are various ways you can contribute. Uh, we're always looking for speakers. If you're building something interesting with open source data tools, talk to us about it. Um, especially if you're from underrepresented groups and if you're a first time PyData speaker, we're going to help you prepare your talk as well. Um, then the organizing team could use some help, certainly. Uh, if you want to be active in speaker outrage and coordination and preparing the meetups, you're very welcome to talk to us and join us. Yeah, sponsorship is also possible for companies. Right now, hosting a meetup is really lightweight. We need a Zoom account, but there will be a time after COVID where um, we're going to move to physical locations again. And you can certainly sponsor as a company uh, location and win some open source karma. Yeah, our agenda for tonight, we have two matching talks. It's all about the cloud this time. Um, first, Samantha is going to tell us about uh, her comparison of the Google Cloud platform and the AWS platform. And in the second talk, Alessandro, Alessandro is going to teach us about AWS CDK, the Amazon Web Services Cloud Development Kit. In between the talks, we are going to have a short break of 10 minutes. And now I can hand over to Maria to introduce the first speaker and the first talk. It's totally a pleasure 
to introduce uh, Samantha Zeitlin. Um, I met her in a really nice network. It is called Women in Machine Learning and Data Science. And also uh, she has a couple of really cool YouTube videos that please check it out later. No, now, now, no, now, no, later. Uh, one is about uh, clustering uh, data science interviews. And it's amazing, Samantha, because it's still, I mean, whatever you said there, it still applies now. Nowadays, it still applies. It's, it will never be legacy, unfortunately. <laughs> and another video she has really awesome about uh, what is being a senior data scientist. So yeah, yeah, please, please, um, Samantha. You, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. I think this is the right one. Oh, hang on. Let's share this one. I see the descent. Yeah, awesome. Okay, you can see that. Okay. Um, well, thank you for the invitation. I'm excited to share things I learned the hard way about the cloud. Um, and I really wanted to just kind of summarize this talk as methods for getting your Python into the cloud. So the difference between running Python locally and running it in a distributed system remotely. And I'll try and give a very high level overview. There's a lot of content in here. If people want to ask questions, please feel free to interrupt me or put things in the chat, but um, I, it, there's kind of a lot. So if we get through all of it, great. If not, that's fine. Um, who is this talk for? I really wrote this for you if you are a data person who uses Python and you've never worked in the cloud before or you've worked on one cloud platform, but you wanna learn more about another one or you're interested in how to choose and use cloud services because there are so many and it can be really hard and overwhelming at first to understand how they all connect to each other. So the agenda, I'll tell you a little bit more about me. Um, I'll tell you more about what I've done with data in the cloud, again, very high level stuff. I'll briefly go over why infrastructure as code is your friend. And then I'll talk a bit about service equivalents on Amazon versus Google so that you can kind of get an overview of which things are the same. Um, I'll also touch on cost differences that you might want to consider if you're shopping around for say a columnar database. Services you won't find on both platforms because they each have some that are unique to one or the other. And then I'll talk a bit about my biased view of what's great about Amazon and what's terrible about it. And the same thing for Google, um, totally my personal perspective. And then if we have time and there's interest, I have some code snippets to, again, sort of illustrate what I think is easy and what's hard about the different approaches for interacting with the cloud with Python. So really briefly, um, I was not a cloud person for the first 20 or so years of my career. I was a cancer research scientist. And I started with small data. And by the time I was finishing up my postdoc, I was doing what would now be considered big data, but we weren't calling it that at the time. And then like snakes on a plane, the inspiration for this talk, I had a very hard time getting people to take me seriously as someone who knew how to analyze data. So what I had to do was um, figure out how to get the right things on my resume. And that was mostly Python and SQL. Luckily for me, I really like Python. It's been about 10 years since I switched over to writing code. Um, and I've been using Amazon. I started at Yahoo. Um, I did that for a couple of years and then GCP for almost two years now also. So I'm not an expert by any means, but I'll give you my perspective as someone who had to learn a lot of these things on my own and from docs. So the kinds of things that I'm able to answer questions on, again, not in depth on all these things. Um, databases that I've used, the big columnar databases, I used Redshift a lot and BigQuery this past year. I've done a little bit with Athena and some with Firebase. Um, permissions I'll talk a bit about today because it's very important. I've also done a lot with containers and Kubernetes on both platforms 
mostly in Pachyderm, which is a service that I've used for hosting machine learning models and pipelines. Um, I've also done a fair amount of ETL, both with streaming and batch. Um, this past year, I did things with PubSub and I supervised a team that was using Dataflow. Uh, when I was on AWS, I used PySpark on EMR and I've used Airflow on both AWS and on GCP and a little bit of cloud functions. So a little bit of serverless. I've also used Looker on both AWS and they were recently acquired by Google. So I've used that on both platforms also. Okay, I was gonna make a architecture overview, but lucky for me about a month ago, this really nice review came out where they made this wonderful diagram that I think does a nice job of summarizing how a typical architecture overflow looks. So on the left here, whoops, you'll see there's a list of data sources. So you might be pulling in data typically from databases that you already have, um, various event collectors within your web app, for example, or your mobile app, logs, third-party APIs, or a file or object storage service. And I'll talk more about those. And then typically you have some kind of streaming or ETL step. So you're gonna have some kind of connectors that either transform the data with SQL or Python. You might have this all in a scheduler like Airflow or Dagster. Then you might do additional transformations with Spark or other kinds of Python libraries like Pandas. And all of this will eventually feed into usually a data warehouse and often also a data lake. Most of the time, by the time you've done all this expensive processing with something like Spark, you wanna back it up in S3. And in addition, you would load it into a big database like Snowflake, BigQuery or Redshift. If you're doing some kind of analysis, you're probably gonna do both batch or um, real-time sort of streaming analysis. And you might have uh, historical look back analysis as well as predictive looking forward analysis. So these kinds of things you might wanna have in different containers or serving on some kind of service that lets you um, connect them together and you might use the same data sources to do different kinds of models. And then you typically have another step which would reformat the results of your models or your analysis to make it easier to share with other people. So that might be dashboards and something like Looker or Tableau or Superset, or you might put it in some sort of web app or something. So that's like kind of a lot of stuff. And this is part of why infrastructure as code is your friend. Historically, everything on the cloud was configured by one person, usually some expert person that you would call the sysadmin, um, and they did everything by hand. And that meant no one else at the company understood how this stuff worked. And then a few years back, we started to shift over to having things in configuration files, but usually that file still lived on one person's hard drive and they were the keepers of all the information. And that meant if they were gone and something broke, you had to wake them up in the middle of the night. So infrastructure as code now means that um, Everything is much more repeatable and automatable, and it can live in version control, which means that it's kind of democratized and software developers have a little more control and we can actually roll it back if we make a mistake. And I experienced this firsthand at Yahoo where we had configuration files that lived on one person's hard drive and they didn't do the best job of keeping track. And then something broke. And then we weren't sure which version to roll it back to. All of those kinds of problems are gone now. And one of the other reasons this type of thing is useful is that if you have a really big cluster, you can easily deploy the same configuration to a bunch of different machines. Um, the one caveat I'll say here is that it can be a security concern and you have to be careful about what goes in your version control when you're talking about infrastructure. And I'll talk a bit about the security aspect of this. Just so we're all on the same page, I wanted to clarify some of the terminology I'm gonna be using because if you haven't been swimming in this jargon a lot, it can be kind of overwhelming. So the way I talk about this stuff, when I say machine, I usually mean a hardware instance. So something like your laptop where it's self-contained hardware. 
When I say instance, that may mean a whole machine or a part of a machine. And that's because that's how they typically refer to these things in the cloud. So when you reserve an instance, it may be an independent machine or it may be part of a machine that you're sharing with other people. A virtual machine then is a type of instance that has its own system kernel that it's self-contained and it can be running a different operating system than the host machine. And you can have several virtual machines per hardware instance. Similarly, but distinctly, containers run this a different operating system than the host machine, but they share the host kernel. So that's the main difference between a virtual machine and a container. And you can have several different containers per machine, or per, you might have a whole cluster of many containers on many machines. And that's typically what we're talking about when we're talking about Docker or Kubernetes. And then serverless is a totally different thing where you're reserving pieces of a machine, but you don't have to worry at all about whether it's in a container or a virtual machine. That's all taken care of for you by the cloud platform. So there's service equivalents on AWS and GCP for the basic functionality. I'm just giving you some highlights of things that I think I've used the most. Um, so you'll find storage. People often talk about S3 on AWS. That's where your files live most of the time. Um, there's a, an equivalent on Google called Google Cloud Storage, GCS. Um, similarly, there's a hosted version of Kubernetes on both platforms. Those are both called Kubernetes service, which makes it kind of convenient. Um, there's also a container registry, which is something you need if you're building a lot of Docker containers and you want to keep track of which version container has the current version of your code. Identity access management is one of the few that has the exact same name on both platforms. And then there's equivalents for serverless code execution, which have totally different names as well as virtual machine services. So typically people would refer to that as compute. And then there are services you won't find on both platforms. So Amazon has a hosted Kafka that they call Kinesis. Um, they're pretty famous for their Elastic Map Reduce, which I've used for Spark. Um, Redshift is very popular as a very large database that was based off an old version of Postgres. And they also have Athena, which is a time series database, which is pretty popular and kind of similar to Snowflake. Google now has Looker. They also have hosted Apache Airflow, hosted Apache Beam, which is a streaming tool, as well as several databases that are Google-only services. OK, so this slide kind of summarizes the main take-home points. So if you're getting overwhelmed, I'll try to give, it, give you all the high points here. Um, so step one to working in the cloud, you have to make sure that all your credentials are correct. This sounds really obvious and trivial, and it's not. So I'll talk a bit more about why this is important and confusing. There's also differences depending on whether you're writing your own code or whether you're using an SDK. But typically, you need some sort of interface to interact with cloud platform services. You have to know quite a bit about the different instance types, especially if you're making decisions about how big should my service be? How fast should my service be? So you might need to know whether you think you're going to want to optimize for input output versus storage or compute. There's also differences depending on size and cost. So in some cases, it makes more sense to have a bigger cluster with a lot of small instances versus one bigger one. And it might not be obvious how that's all going to add up in terms of the cost. There's also differences depending on where you need to run in the world. And there's also differences on AWS. I think Google has an equivalent also where you can reserve on demand. So machine space that's available unpredictably is cheaper. It's shared with other people versus if you're willing to pay a little more, you can have reserved instances that are always available for you. And then there's questions about scale. So one thing that's very different in the cloud that you usually don't have to worry about as much locally is just the fact that there's so much data accumulating most of the time. If you're in the cloud, usually you have a lot of data. So you need to set time to live or basically expiration time for things that are accumulating. Or 
And sometimes in addition, you have to have scripts that will help remove things that are accumulating. So the kinds of things that are gonna accumulate would be say rows in your database. At Yahoo, we were loading 40 billion rows of data a day, which meant we had scripts that ran every day to remove data that was more than three days old because we simply could not store it all. And the same thing happens for files in S3, especially if you're backing things up. And then you also need to consider, do we wanna put say data that's a month or 90 days old into long-term storage? Because you might have legal concerns for keeping a historical record, but you simply cannot afford to keep it all in S3. And there's usually no reason to because you're often not gonna to touch that data again once you've already analyzed it. But there's a cost to pulling things out of deep freeze. So there's some concerns there also. We can talk more about that later if people are interested. Um, there's also other little gotchas. Like I did not know that on Google, you cannot set a time to live on your containers. So if you have a bunch of containers in the Google Cloud registry, you have to have a script that will go through and remove the old ones when you're done with them. So if you're updating your code all the time and every time you deploy a new version, you create a new container, you now have a giant repository with hundreds of copies of this code, most of which is pretty similar to the previous version. So at some point you have to start to expire the old ones that you're not using anymore. Um, another little gotcha, some regions are more expensive than others. So for historical reasons, Amazon East is a lot cheaper than Amazon West. So things like that are worth paying attention to because they do add up at scale. Networking concerns are also another thing you might not have thought about if you're just running on your local machine. So you would think that connecting services within the same cloud, within an account that you own, should be easy but it's not always that simple. And the distance might be a concern if you're worried about latency because now you're working in global, right? And because you're working in a global scale, there's also concerns about privacy and those might be different depending on the regions that you're operating in and where your customers are from. So GDPR, COPPA, things like that you really want to be very careful to consider um, where are we retaining data? How long are we retaining data? Is it encrypted? Does it need to be encrypted? All these kinds of things will slow things down if you have to decrypt when you transfer data, all this kind of stuff. Um, and one other little fun thing for data science people, if you're used to running notebooks locally, you'll find that running them in the cloud can be really slow and might be more confusing. <laughs> So cost differences, as I mentioned, at scale, it, it becomes much more of a factor to consider. So Redshift is in some ways more complicated at first because you have to decide what kind of instance types you want, how many. So let's say I'm pretty sure I need enough to control whatever, several millions of rows. I've got um, some amount of stuff that I know I need to process fairly quickly. I might wanna optimize for input output over storage or compute because I know that I'm spending most of my time copying data into the database and then retrieving it out with queries. BigQuery on the other hand, you have no control over any of that. You're sharing a global cluster effectively and you're going to get charged for every query you run and that includes both inserts and retrievals but you also get charged for storage. So if the data is just sitting there and you're not using it, you're still getting charged, it's just at a lower rate. And the other kind of awful gotcha about BigQuery is that you can't really optimize things by scaling up your cluster or changing the type of instance you're on. You're pretty much stuck with changing your schema and otherwise it's just gonna be as fast as it is and as expensive as it is. You, you don't really have any control over that. So bottom line there, um, if you're running a lot of queries all the time, like around the clock, then Redshift can end up being cheaper. And if you're only gonna run queries a few days a week, it might be cheaper to use something like BigQuery. So these are the kinds of things that you have to really sort of dig into the details of how these services work and how the pricing works so that you can make an informed decision depending on your company's needs and your project's needs. All right, so I mentioned that credentials and, and who you are is really important. And again, I'm gonna define a couple of terms. Hopefully this will help clarify things. But when I say credentials, usually I'm referring to the set of keys that you're using to log in 
And when I say profile, usually that is a set of keys or a role that you are assuming that has a set of keys. And this will become clearer hopefully as I go along. Authorization is whether your role is allowed and authentication is the moment when you actually have your keys accepted when you've actually logged in. And if you've used a lot of third party APIs, you're probably pretty familiar with authorization versus authentication, but I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page about that. So to make things simple, IAM roles are a good thing. You should use them. Um, if you're a new company and you haven't done this before, you might start out by trying to configure permissions for each person on your team or each service separately. That will very quickly become a total headache. You're much better off creating a role and configuring batches of permissions. And I'll explain a little more what I mean by that. So a role might be something like Redshift Reader, where you would say anyone who is an analyst or a person on a, another team, they have access to read Redshift, but they can't do anything else with it. Another role then might be a data engineer who would have Redshift Reader as well as Redshift Writer as well as EMR access. And you can combine, combine these together so they can become hierarchical basically and you can inherit sets of permissions um, up to you know, however many levels you want. And this makes it much, much simpler to add and remove batches of permissions and to be much clearer on who has access to what. Another thing I wanna emphasize Google pretty much forces you to use service accounts now. Um, AWS hasn't always made that as clear, but this also gives you a much safer way to control access to different services rather than doing it on a per person basis. And then there's another whole layer on top of roles, which you don't need to worry as much about for GCP, but for AWS is very important, which is policies. Um, so just to give you a little hint here, there's six whole types of policies. I'm only gonna mention four. AWS makes you control and keep track of identity-based policies. So for users, groups, or roles, resource-based, so you can have additional sets of policies that control things like S3 buckets, which it's kind of cool that it's so fine grained that you can go all the way down to an individual bucket, but that also means that it's another thing you have to keep track of. You don't need to worry about access control lists unless you're doing cross account access, which I don't recommend. I have a whole blog post about why cross account access on AWS is hard, um, but we can talk more about that if anyone's interested. And then there's things like session policies, which you would hope you don't need to know about, but some services actually require you to renew a token every hour. And EMR is one of these. So your code actually has to have an extra loop in it to double check is my session token still valid. Okay, so I know that all sounds really boring and tedious. And you might be wondering why do I have to care about this? But like I mentioned, the GDPR, Child Protection Act, data security and privacy rules are a really big deal. And if you're in data, you really do need to be aware of who has access to the data, what your retention policies are. And ideally someone else on another team would be keeping track of all this, but in my experience, the data team always has to know a lot about it. Um, I've always had to do most of this myself. Even at Yahoo, we had to do most of this ourselves. So I pulled this quote from a Slack channel just this week, I was watching someone complain about having problems with AWS and, I thought this was great, where she basically says, we got stuck in a loop where we couldn't do an AWS action because we didn't have the right permissions. So we assumed an admin role, but the admin role's policy blocked it from doing anything. So <laughs> this just gives you an example of like how confusing this can be. Um, so long story short, this is a little summary slide. You really need to have matching sets of roles and policies. So for example, in the little green circle on the left here, I am a data scientist. I have a data scientist role, which means I'm allowed to use the S3 buckets in this account. The bucket on the right then in the gray circle has a policy on it that says, I'm allowed to be used by people with the data scientist role. And as long as all that stuff matches, you're good. But um, the documentation has improved a lot is the good news. So uh, it's, there's more examples and it's less confusing, but this is something that really can make or break the amount of time you spend and the amount of time you're able to spend on your code because it's very easy to end up with um, 
just errors that don't make sense. You don't know why your stuff is failing. It turns out it's a permissions error, but it won't necessarily tell you that. It'll just say fail and you won't know why. All right, having said all that, cloud versus cloud. Now, hopefully we have enough background to, for you to understand why I have the opinions that I have. Um, so what's great about AWS, there's a lot of services. They really, they have a lot of coverage for everything you could possibly want to do. There's storage, there's compute, there's databases, there's streaming. Um, and it's very, very secure. They generally will not let you do anything stupid as long as you follow their recommendations. And it's pretty easy to switch back and forth between accounts. You basically have a profile that keeps track of all your credentials, and then you can just switch to a different set of credentials. Redshift, I thought, like I said, it's pretty nice. Um, there were things about it that I didn't love when I was using it, but now having used BigQuery, there's things I miss about Redshift. They also make it fairly easy for you to log into your machine and there's the observability aspect of it is pretty good. I really didn't have any trouble getting my logs or getting help when I needed to debug things. Um, they also make it pretty easy to access your profile from regardless of what path you're in on your machine, which again, you'd think that wouldn't matter that much, but it's actually a major time saver. Things I hate about AWS, <laughs> um, the, the key might be a symbol, but the UI is awful. Um, the, these cloud services, the, the UIs are just absolutely terrible. It's, it's hard to find things. Things aren't labeled well. It's hard to figure out what's going on sometimes. Um, it's so secure that it's actually hard to get work done. And this unfortunately can lead some people to try to cheat. And that can actually make things a lot less secure than they would be otherwise. One of the examples of where, why it's so hard to use and it can actually make it hard to get work done is that if you wanna log in from another service, sometimes that's actually harder than logging in from your laptop. And that's totally unintuitive if you're not a networking and security person. There's also a lack of consistency across a lot of the services. So some services require you to have a certain type of role and an additional policy. Others require both. Some require, you know, only one or the other. So it's it's very confusing. Um, and then there's these weird edge cases like the one I mentioned with EMR and tokens, where unless you really dig into how the architecture works, it might not be obvious why it works that way. And you wouldn't necessarily know that this is something you need to worry about. As I mentioned, it's also very hard to share things across accounts. Okay, so what's great about GCP? It's much, much easier to use generally. Um, there's more integrations across services and they're simpler. And some of those examples would be, it's very easy to run say a BigQuery magic that lets you connect directly to your database from inside a notebook. The connections between PubSub, Dataflow, and BigQuery are kind of turnkey. You just sort of click boxes and it's done. Um, so overall, I'd say it's much more developer-centric. It doesn't feel as much like it was written by security professionals. It feels more like it was written by developers. So overall, security is much, much simpler to configure, and you don't have to spend as much time worrying about that. It's also easy to create multiple projects per account. Um, AWS doesn't have an equivalent of a project, so that makes it more complicated to think about how your architecture should work and how you can break up services and aspects of your application. Okay, GCP is not perfect, unfortunately. Um, the UI is also bad. It's probably just as bad as Amazon's, just in a different kind of bad. There are more problems with the code changing. So you're relying on SDKs that are often community contributed and they might be out of date. There's also a lot less support for Python than I would like. Um, they still tend to develop more for Java and JavaScript sooner and Python is sometimes lagging behind for some of these services. Um, observability is harder. They have a service called Stackdriver that you typically would hook up for your logs. And sometimes there's certain types of log levels that you just can't even get. It's very unintuitive um, and it's just complicated to configure and weird. 
There's another thing you have to keep in mind, which is that they don't retain their logs long term. So if your logs are hard to find or they don't have everything you need, you can't hope that the Google support people will help you because they're very slow to respond. And by the time they get back to you, they might have already thrown away the logs from whatever the problem was that you were having. And that actually happened to me with PubSub. Some other services like Firebase are still really under construction. So things that worked last year might not work this year. And because of the way they do their keys and the fact that there aren't really profiles, a lot of times you end up with keys sort of littered all over your machine and you have a key and copied all over different folders and it ends up being kind of insecure in that sense. All right, so speaking Python to the cloud, I don't know how we're doing on time. Um, most important thing I have to tell you, if you get nothing else out of this talk, <laughs> You have to use logging. It isn't as important when you're running locally, you can just do print statements, whatever. If you're running in the cloud, you are relying on your logs as your primary way to tell what's working and what's not in your application. Um, so the types of things you would log are typically the same things you'd put in a print statement, but usually you also want things like timestamps, file names that went in and out of each step, and obviously errors. You might also use other kinds of third-party applications like Sentry or Datadog to give you additional observability into your errors and your application performance. Python SDKs are um, kind of limited still. And I'm really curious to hear Alessandro's talk because I'm hoping that that's going to solve some of this problem. But historically, the software development kits that were available weren't really software development kits. They're kind of just libraries that give you some interfaces. So the main one people use for AWS is Boto3. It already knows how to get your credentials out of your profile and it has some built-in functionality. So there's already methods for interacting with S3 and EMR. And people have written additional wrappers that use Boto3 that make it a little easier. So the advantages to using a tool like this is that you don't have to write everything yourself from scratch. But the drawbacks are that you have to make sure you're on the latest versions and there might be major changes. So like the transition from Boto 2 to Boto 3 was super painful when we did it at Yahoo. Um, and the documentation historically has not been great. So it can be very hard to find examples of the correct way to do certain things. It's not always obvious whether the functionality really does what you want or not. GCP has kind of the opposite problem. There's a ton of libraries out there, but a lot of them are defunct. So these are just a couple examples. So the one on the left was last updated six years ago. The one on the right was last updated eight years ago. They both have the same name. They have totally different interfaces and neither one of them works. So <laughs> this most recent Firebase app that I built, what I ended up having to do was use the Firebase admin library and that knew how to get my token from my local environment. Everything else I had to do with requests. So I actually had to build up the URL myself and tell it exactly where to look for my database and my project and my collection, which is where all my data lives within the database. Um, and it, that's the kind of stuff that I would have thought there'd be more automation around. And it's for Python, at least, it's still harder than it ought to be. This stuff is much nicer in JavaScript for something like Firebase, which is primarily used for mobile apps these days. Um, I've got a bit more example code. I think we have time um, if people are interested or I can stop there and we can take questions. Should I keep going or we wanna do questions? I can't tell what the thumbs up means. <laughs> okay, thumbs up for yes questions. I don't know. There was a question by Felix. There is only one so far. For sure, later there will be more. If you ask me, I would prefer that you go on. Okay, I'll go quickly and then we'll still have a few minutes. Um, so both AWS and GCP have uh, command line interfaces that you can install that let you set your credentials. The AWS one is pretty straightforward. There's only a handful of things they ask for. The Google side is a little more confusing and it may, depending on what service you're using, ask you to enter more things. Plus, then you have to make sure that the one you're using is active. 
So when I say check your credentials, you need to be able to do this both on your local machine and sometimes if you're logged into a remote machine to make sure that the credentials that that machine or container are using is, are the correct ones. Um, so on the left, you can see there's um, two profiles in this example set of credentials. So one is the default and then one is something they named user one. Um, and they have different sets of keys it's really easy to switch between these with the AWS CLI and it's not that hard to check which profile am I on. On Google, it's a little more confusing. This is just a stack overflow example, but basically you have to list how many accounts do I have? You have to set the account that you wanna have active. Then you have to list the projects within that account and you have to set which project am I on? And there might be additional things you have to set depending on what service you're using. Um, and then I have an example with EMR just to give you the full headache of what it is with AWS. Um, so this is an overview map before I show you the code because there's so much going on. I don't want it to be super confusing. So start out, we know we have our credentials that let us have access to EMR. And we're going to set up a cluster configuration which tells AWS, these are the types of machines that I want. Our Python code is living locally on our machine to start with, but we have to push it up to S3 so that the EMR service can have access to it. Same thing where we need to push up bootstrap code. Bootstrap code is what you use to install your Python dependencies into the cluster. So this all needs to happen in addition to then pushing up your Spark job specs so that EMR knows what instance types, how much of the cluster to use for your particular Spark job. So here's an example. Um, this is several pages worth of code. I'll try to go through it quickly. You have to import Voto3. You're going to use that. I have also used config parser in the past because it makes it slightly simpler to pull out particular parts of your credentials. And if you're doing logging on the cloud, you're going to want to use a stream handler. Otherwise, you're going to find that you don't get all your logs back from the cluster. So that's another thing that's a little different from doing logging locally. Then we've got a giant class. This is how I've done it in the past. It's not beautiful, but um, it does give you a way to keep tabs on all the different configurations. So I've got this huge list of parameters. I've got a path to my local credentials. I've got a profile, a name for my Spark job. That's the Python file I'm gonna use. And I've got a bootstrap script. So I'm gonna pass all this stuff in. I'm gonna go through and parse out of my configuration all the information for the cluster. So region, number of instances. I have to tell it where to look for my logs to go. It's gonna be an S3 path um, among other things. So just moving quickly here. Um, then you've got a whole step where you have to set up the cluster. So you pass all this stuff in and you say, okay, I know I want these types of instances the master instance that runs, and it's unfortunately, this is, I don't know if this is still current, but the nomenclature they're using is still considered unpolitically correct. Um, you'd have a leader instance that keeps track of the scheduling of the jobs, and then the worker instances that actually run the job. And then you'll have the number of instances you want. You need to decide things like, do I want my cluster to shut down if my job finishes or crashes? because otherwise you're gonna get charged for that whole time while your cluster is stuck or your job has failed. Um, on the other hand, you can't debug if you let your cluster shut down when something crashes. So often when you're developing, you wanna keep it in a mode where it actually stays running even if your job fails. And then you have to keep an eye on it and log in as soon as anything fails and try and figure out what's wrong. And when you actually submit the Spark job, you have to tell Spark how much of the resources that are available you want it to use and how to allocate that, those resources. Um, so that's more stuff that's sort of Spark specific. Then you have to tell it, okay, Bootstrap, here's the path to my Bootstrap script from S3 in order to install all your Python dependencies because they otherwise they won't be there in the cluster. Finally, before you can actually run the job, you have to tell EMR which version of Python you want to run because AWS supports multiple versions of Python. 
And you may find that if you switch Python versions that your code won't run the way you expected. Um, there's also additional stuff that I'm not gonna go over right now that has to do with encryption. So you have to include encryption keys um, and you have to specify which roles have access to the encryption keys. So that's kind of a lot. This is why you want something like CDK because otherwise it just ends up being super complicated. Um, bottom line, clouds are fun. It can be really expensive. I strongly recommend learning them on somebody else's dime. I learned most of my cloud stuff at Yahoo and Triller. Um, don't forget to shut down your cluster. I fortunately never really had this problem, but I've heard horror stories about people who ran a job that failed or spun up something to do a model and then forgot about it and ended up with hundreds or thousands of dollars of bills um, from the equipment that they had reserved. Don't be surprised if the docs are wrong or out of date. Um, this, this is really common and uh, you know not that different from other kinds of Python, but it's even more confusing when you're working with cloud stuff where you don't have access to the code most of the time. And finally, logging. Log, do logging, logging's your friend. Uh, acknowledgements, I wanna thank the people who helped me out at Yahoo. The Hangout Slack has been incredibly helpful if you have questions about security or cloud things. They're great people to ask. Um, so I mostly did AWS at Yahoo. At Sentry, I've done mostly GCP. So thank you to those people. The Pachyderm guys have been tremendously helpful in helping me learn more about Kubernetes. My partner also helped me with this talk a little bit. And thank you all for inviting me. That's it. Yay. I'm trying to clap for uh, 36 people. <laughs> we can have a round of virtual applause with the reaction button here. Oh, yeah, right. Reaction button is on the, um, when you go to participants, that would be down, there would be some little icons. I really like your talk, Samantha. I couldn't follow everything. I had to rewatch it and rewatch it. The explanation was awesome. It's just me. <laughs> oh, so we have two questions. Um, Christian, if it's okay for you, I think we can make them now because after Alessandro talk, Alex, Alex, Alessandro's talk, there will be plenty of time for all the questions, but now we only have two. Yeah, okay. So let's go for, for the question by Felix. Felix, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Maybe it's better because my English accent is horrible. <laughs> well, I don't know how bad my German accent is actually. <laughs> um... Uh, I, I still seem to have it after four years in Australia. Still people think it sounds strange. Um, so yeah, I we are in a situation that we are building up um, a social media observatory. So we need some data warehouse solution. We are kind of um, determined on Amazon Web Services simply because they have a, um, because there's by the DFN, so the German Research Network, is kind of a, it's Ausschreibungsgedöns. Um, so it's just bureaucracy. Um, so we are kind of uh, locked on AWS. But um, I only have experience actually with Google Cloud and BigQuery. So I was wondering like how hard will it be to um, switch to Redshift? I know you've done it the other way around, but um, what do you think are the main obstacles um, that I should prepare for? I think honestly, the biggest difference is going to be that you can't really dump JSON into Redshift the same way you can with BigQuery. So I think that's one of the things that you either love or hate about BigQuery, right? Is being able to actually query on JSON. Um, Redshift doesn't handle that very well. So you might have to do more ETL basically to get your data into a more um, cleaned up structure because it really is a more of an old school relational database that way. But otherwise, I think it's mostly pretty easy. And if you decide that you want to change instance types, for example, they've made that pretty easy too. Um, it's all fairly automated now and you mostly just click buttons and tell it, okay, I want to go to back this up and here's my new cluster. And then let's copy over to my new cluster. It'll tell you how long it'll take. Um, so that's all pretty friendly now. 
and a lot less scary than it used to be. That's good to hear because that was one of my main concerns because it's impossible to predict like exactly yeah. what we will need. I mean, it's it's real world data. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and it's pretty normal that you might have to scale your cluster up over time, right? You might start yeah. with one or two instances and then find actually now we need three or four. So. Yeah, I, I thought that this function should exist, but I thought often enough that something should exist and then you had to do it by hand. So I know it's like, yeah. so that's good to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Uh, I think Christian has also a, a question. Uh, yes, first of all, thanks, Samantha, for the great overview. Um, since you talked about Spark on AWS, I was wondering if you've heard of a tool called Flint Rock that's uh, there to help you to quickly spin up a Spark cluster in AWS. And I've only used it for small educational demonstrations, but it made the setup fairly easy. But that's not really in production. So I, I was wondering if you know um, anything about it and it would, it, would it make your workflow easier? Yeah, I don't know. I think there's a lot of people who use the Spark submit um, command line style where you basically just end up with a long command with a bunch of parameters attached to it. And I personally don't like to do it that way because I've found that it's much more error prone and that's part of why I do it in this giant JSON mm -hmm. format. Um, the one advantage to doing it in the JSON format is that once you set it all up, usually you only have to make minor modifications and it's easy to share and it's all version controlled and all of that good stuff. So that's part of why I've done it that way. Um, but I haven't really looked enough at Flint Rock to see how that all works in terms of um, configuring it and if it's easy to version control and, and avoid those little typos that we all tend to make. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Okay, we'll stop there for now. Thanks again. We still may come up later after Alessandro's talk. I mean, Questions also for Samantha, I mean. So, okay, before we go to Alessandro's talk, we are going to go to a quick break of 10 minutes. So let's meet again at 7.35 here for Alessandro's talk. Thank you.
Mr. is back. I am back. I am back. I totally didn't leave, like Samantha, right? <laughs> we, we were here. Uh -uh. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Yeah, I don't want to start without Christian. I'm here. Ah, awesome. And Alessandro is here. Yeah. So we are ready. Welcome back from the break, everyone. Um, let me introduce you to our second speaker on the cloud, Alessandro Romano, who works as a data scientist for a logistics company called CarbonX here in Hamburg. And I'm really looking forward to this. I'm hoping to learn a lot more about infrastructure as code. Alessandro, the stage is yours. Yeah, many thanks. Okay, let me share my slides. Okay, hope you can see them well. Perfect. Yeah, many thanks. So um, just a few words about me. My name, as you know, is Alessandro. I'm working for a logistics company as a data scientist. Uh, eventually I left like a few links here so you can reach me out on LinkedIn, GitHub or Medium. So this talk is about AWS CDK. CDK stands for Cloud Development Kit. And we will go through how to provision your cloud application using Python. So I know that we have like people that are somehow familiar with the cloud. Um, maybe, maybe, I mean, there are some people that actually are not. So this presentation if, is for everyone actually. So you can, um, you can understand what cloud computing uh, means and why we're going to this kind of topics. And if you're really familiar with the cloud computing, you will get to know a, a AWS CDK. So how to deploy your application with CDK. So we will start with a brief introduction about cloud computing. Then we move to uh, infrastructure as a code and the implementation of infrastructure as a code. Uh, AWS CDK provides actually, I mean, Amazon provides actually an implementation of this uh, uh, infrastructure as a code and it's called CDK. Uh, then we will, we are going to see um, a really nice and small um, use case. Uh, so we're going to build this uh, small application with Python and CDK. And in the end of this presentation, we're going to check out why you should look for, I mean, why you should actually check out CDK, why you maybe, why you maybe want to use it and what kind of, um, you know, things you can actually take from this talk. So uh, the cloud computing as a service. I'm really happy because Samantha actually gave us a really nice introduction of a lot of interesting things from AWS and Google Cloud. Um, so just to keep it really simple, um, cloud computing is usually about hiding a lot of complexity. So you want to focus on the application you want to build, an application you want to develop. So you don't want to manage the system, manage the data center. You don't want to do this stuff. You just want to focus on the code you want to write for your application. So cloud computing as a service is about that. So you can imagine, for instance, um, a really nice time series services, uh, service that is actually that allows you to uh, work with time series. So you, so you just have to uh, submit your data and then do some analytics and forecasting. Uh, but you don't really, and maybe deploy also some model if you if you want. But you don't really have to take care of the complexity under the hood. So you won't uh, administrate anything of uh, the infrastructure that is actually built under the hood, but you just have to somehow look at the front end implementation of this service. But 
actually we do have a lot of complexity under the hood that we don't want to take care of. This is a, a bit outdated actually overview of the Amazon services. So the logos um, are not the actual ones. So in the, in the next slides, you will see different logos for the services that we're going to use. But this gives you a really nice overview of the services from AWS Cloud. Um, in this presentation, we're going to focus on AWS Lambda, uh, S3 Bucket, and Amazon API Gateway. Uh, I can say these are probably three of the most famous services uh, pretty used, especially S3, especially used for, for everything. So uh, let's jump to uh, cloud computing in practice. So a really nice example is AWS Lambda. AWS Lambda personally is something that I use, I would say every day. Uh, it's a serverless compute service and it allows you to basically focus on the code that you want to write for your application. So that means that you just have to write, just to give you an example, the code for your ETL, and you don't have to um, take care of manage the infrastructure under the hood, but you just have to somehow deploy the code of your ETL. And this can be done with uh, AWS Lambda. But of course, under the hood, we do have some complexity. So we have, in this case, Lambda is uh, based on, uh, is implemented with Docker. Um, we do have some Linux machines. Uh, we have auto scaling and much more. But what you just see is a place where you can upload your code and then you can run your application as a serverless application. And this is also a really nice point because serverless means that you always, that you can, run your application on demand. So you don't have to spin up um, a proper instance, for instance, like a proper EC2 instance, uh, but you can just focus on a serverless, serverless application that is actually run uh, every time you need it. So as I said, AWS Lambda is something that we're going to see. And now let's define what a stack is. In this case, of course, a stack of services. So a stack is basically a collection of all the services that you need within your application. And uh, here we have a really nice example of a design of an API, uh, API uh, based of course on Lambda. So we have the Amazon API gateway that we will, that will take care of um, trigger the Lambda function. So we get the um, so once we trigger the Lambda function, we can basically take care of the request and then do whatever we want. In this case, this Lambda function is going to write back something into the database. Um, you can see this example like as an, an API, or maybe you can also think of this design for uh, an ETL, as I just said. So how do we uh, deploy uh, our stack in AWS? We have CloudFormation. CloudFormation is a service that allows you um, to deploy your stack by using a template. So the template is a, usually is a JSON or a YAML file, and it basically describes you all the resources and the dependencies that you need uh, to deploy your stack. And why do you want to do that? I mean, you can easily, basically you can easily open the AWS console and click a few buttons and basically spin up an EC2 instance, create a Lambda function. So do exactly what we can see here. So we can create this, this, this stack through AWS, through the AWS console from the browser. But this is not what we want to do, of course, because if you do that, you, can, you cannot really reproduce it. So you, you're, you're not basically keeping track of the changes. But instead, what you want to do, what you want to do is using, for instance, CloudFormation, create a template that basically defines your stack and then submit this template to AWS and create all the resources that you need that, that you need for your application. And this means that you can have some control on what you're doing. You can update your stack, uh, you can modify it. Uh, and of course, once you put it on Git, 
uh, on GitHub, you can you, you basically have some uh, versioning and you keep track of all the changes. Now, uh, provisioning with cloud formation. So cloud formation is a really, really important service. And if you if you want to deploy something, you have to know cloud formation. You have to know somehow how, how cloud formation works. So cloud formation, of course, I mean, it's a really important service, but in the same time, it has some downsides. So first of all, CloudFormation uses template. Uh, and this template, as I said, are basically YAML file or JSON files. Um, and this is not actually a programming language. So um, it's almost free text. You can have some helps from your editor, but most of the time, it's, it's not really, I mean, it's not really handy work with these kind of files. Then the second point is that you don't have any guarantee that your stack is correct. So most of the time you have to deploy to, I mean, usually you have to deploy to understand if you're doing something right. You have to wait. And if you have like a really big application, you have to wait a lot. And then in the end, you will see that something was wrong. So not really nice. Um, the third point is that cloud, cloud formation templates lack abstraction. So that means that you have, sometimes you have to specify too many stuff, too many things in your template. Uh, and it's not really handy because uh, let's say you just want to deploy a really simple API with that consists of uh, API gateway, Lambda function, and maybe a connection to a database as we uh, saw in the, um, as we just saw in the, in the, in the, in the previous slide. Um, you really don't want to define things which are not necessary from like an application point of view. So you want to have some abstraction. You want to say, okay, I just want to define a Lambda function, but I don't want to take care of so many parameters. But we do have like an alternative. This alternative is called AWS CDK. Um, with AWS CDK, we can basically define our stack with a programming language. So AWS CDK is implementation of infrastructure as a code. As, as you can imagine, is basically, it means that you're going to define your infrastructure with code. Uh, and you can use a programming language. In this case, CDK actually provides, um, can be used with Python, TypeScript, I think Java maybe, and some other languages. In our case, of course, we're going to focus on Python. So, uh, first of all, as I said, you can use a programming language. And then, in my case, I use PyCharm. I get a lot of help from PyCharm. So PyCharm can actually, or any kind of editor, can actually help you to understand if you are writing the right things into uh, your Slack, if you, into, into your stack. So if you're actually defining your stack in, the, in a proper way, in the right way. Um, the, set, the, the third point that actually I, I would say it uh, looks like trivial, looks like something you don't really want to take care of, but it's really important. It's built on top of cloud formation. So you do have the power of cloud formation. It's not something uh, completely new. Uh, you, can think of, you can think of CDK like uh, an interface of cloud formation, basically. Um, then you can use some logic. You can use if statements, for loops. Uh, this is actually an example. So here we have in the Lambda function definition, we have F, we have basically a string formatted with Python uh, that contains, which contains Lambda dash ID. And the ID is basically a variable coming from um, another part of this code. Uh, and this is really interesting. So because basically you can use your programming language and, and you can do whatever you want within your stack. And it's easy to share and reuse. Also, this part looks trivial, but it's not. In this case, this is a Lambda function, but every time that I have to define a Lambda function or I have to define a Lambda REST API, as you can see here, I always go back to the projects that I've built so far and I pick all the pieces that I need to the new stack. And I can tell you this is not uh, something uh, 
like the, 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 for which you can say, okay, uh, I don't really care. I do care because I have a lot of projects for which I use CDK and I really need to go back and be able to reuse the code that I that I have written so far. So um, let's build up our, our first application. So I decided to show you this uh, study case. Uh, it's a really simple one, uh, but it's actually something that I have that I had to deal in the past several times. So it's it's not like something that I made for this talk. It's a real life problem, I would say. Um, first of all, the problem is about deploying a REST API for our machine learning model. For the people that are into like machine learning concept, we're talking about inference. So it's not, a, it's not training, but we want to use the model with, that we train. So this is in a machine learning pipeline is called the inference. Uh, the context, we are training a model every night and then we save this model into an S3 bucket. You probably already know, thanks to Samantha, you probably already know what's, uh, what an S3 bucket is. Um, so we basically save the model into this uh, uh, storage space. Uh, of course, we assume this is already implemented. It's not part of this talk. Um, the solution is retrieving the model from a Lambda function, which will be called by the gateway. And then we deploy everything with CDK. As you can see here, we have the design of what we want to implement. So we have uh, an Amazon API gateway that will take care of that will take care of the requests, and then of course to uh, send back the response. This Amazon API gateway will trigger the Lambda function. The Lambda function contains the code of our application. In this case, it's about uh, retrieving the model from S3, use the model to make the prediction and build the response. So we will get back a JSON that can be used, uh, I don't know, in another context. And the JSON, of course, will contain um, the prediction. And as I said, we read this information from S3 and the model somehow is already saved in S3 by someone else, not us. Okay, the CDK project structure. So before looking into the proper code, let's see how we have to set up the project and how what kind of packages do we need. So uh, first of all, we have a Lambda, the, the code, the Lambda code, basically, the code that we want to uh, upload in the Lambda function. So in this case, I created a Lambda directory. Uh, it's not necessary, but I mean, for convenience, you want to do that. Uh, and here we're going to store the code of our application. And in this case, it's called API backend.py. Then we have the first CDK file, the Python implementation of our stack. So in this file, we're going to define how our stack looks like. And this means defining all the resources and all the dependencies that we need to deploy the stack. And in the end, we have the CDK JSON um, we don't really have to focus on this file. It's uh, usually by default, you don't have, you only have um, like a JSON with uh, one field, uh, but I can tell you this is really useful and I usually used it a lot. Uh, I put a lot of parameters in it. Uh, maybe we'll do another talk about it. It's definitely worth it. Um, so step number one, we have to install CDK. Um, you can have, I mean, you, you can just look at the AWS uh, documentation. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I think you should use Node.js once you have CDK on your machine. And of course, an AWS account uh, because you have to set it up. Uh, then you can start to with the first like instruction that is about initiate your project. Then the second step is installing all the packages that you need for your application. That means AWS Lambda, AWS S3, AWS API Gateway. Uh, this is what we decided during the design, basically. Okay, now we can have a look at the code. So let me switch to PyCharm. Here we are. I hope you can see it. So 
let's start with the app.py. So this is basically the project that I decided to implement. So this is based on the use case that we just uh, saw, and uh, this is what I decided to implement. So first of all, we imported all the libraries that we need for the project. That means the Lambda API Gateway S3. Of course, this is Lambda dash because Lambda, as we probably know, is already taken from Python. And the first step is creating the main class. This is also pretty trivial. I mean, it more or less, it's always the same uh, source. We just have to create this header for the class and then use the code.stack class and we're basically done. Now we switch, we go to uh, the definition of the services that we need within our stack. Um, first of all, we say that we need, we need a Lambda function. So let's start implementing it. Uh, in the Lambda function, as you can see, we are basically calling Lambda.function. This means that we're going to create an object, um, I think, uh, sorry, an attribute that is, uh, based on the Lambda function type. So what we're going to do is, first of all, defining an ID. Usually this has to be unique. The way I like to make it unique is by formatting the string with, in this case, Lambda dash ID. ID is basically the name of our stack. The name of our stack is coming from here. And why do we know that this is, why are we sure that this is unique? Uh, because you cannot upload a stack with the same, two stacks with the same name. Uh, then we have to specify what the code is. Um, so code equal to Lambda, asset code Lambda. So this basically, this is basically telling to uh, Lambda where the code is located. And this, in this case, we just say that the code is located in the Lambda directory. Um, then we have to specify the handler. So just to be clear, these are all arguments that are not, so basically this, these are concepts that are not related to CDK, but instead this is all about defining, creating a Lambda, Lambda function. So now we have to specify the handler. Really easy. Uh, the handler is basically the main function of the Lambda uh, function that we created. In this case, I can already give you a glimpse of what we're talking about. So this is the Lambda handler. So the Lambda handler is located in the API backend file and the function name is Lambda handler. Uh, then we can define like a few common stuff for every Python uh, application, for every Lambda application. It is the timeout, the memory size, and the runtime. We don't really care for now about this information, but of course, in a real context, you want to um, think of how much memory and what's the timeout of your Lambda function. Then we switch to the API gateway uh, definition. So we can already see that we have really uh, built-in um, uh, method for the Lambda REST API. Um, this is basically also something really nice because that means that if you want to build a REST API, you already have something that does the job for you. Um, with the REST API, with the Lambda REST API, we just have to, of course, define um, the ID of this uh, API gateway resource, the handler. So that means, okay, once you call uh, this, um, this API, what do we have to do? What do I have to do? I have to call, I have to trigger the Lambda function. And in this case, the Lambda function is the one we just defined. So we say handler equal to Lambda function and then the REST API name. Uh, We're almost done because the last thing that we have to define is the bucket. So. Uh, we say that we want to read the model from the S3 bucket. That means that we have to give the Lambda function the permission to read the bucket. How can we do that? We just have to create a new um, bucket entity. And we do that with S3 bucket from bucket name. And we just pass as an argument, as a parameter, the test 
bucket that is basically the name of the bucket where the model is located. And now we can definitely give the Lambda function the rights to read uh, any files from this bucket. And in the end, we just have a few um, lines of code um, that are basically about creating the object that is our stack, the PyData model, and then deploy it once we're ready to, to call basically uh, to execute uh, the CDK deploy command. So let's have a look at the CDK JSON. As I say, this is, this is quite simple. I mean, you don't have to do anything. It works out of the box. You just have to define uh, app equal to Python three app dot pi. This basically is saying to the is telling to CDK that we're going to use Python three for this application because, as I said, you can use different kind of languages like TypeScript. I think Java, C sharp. I don't really remember, um, but potentially just to give you also uh, an idea of how you can use this file. You can actually pass through CDK some parameters. So what you can do, for instance, is defining some uh, max time and then, for instance, 500. And, and then basically you can use this max time within this file and parameterize the stack. So you can parameterize the definition of the Lambda function. So you here in, in, in this uh, part of the code, you can use the max time that you defined in the CDK JSON. Now let's have a look at the core of our application. So here is where we define uh, basically the core of the API. So he, here is where we define what the API does every time that we call the API. As we said, we don't really have a model on S3. So get model from S3 is not doing anything. Potentially you can use bottle tree and with five lines of code, you can just retrieve your model. Uh, of course, we don't have like a proper model on S3 at the moment. Also make prediction just to let you understand is not really doing anything because we don't have a model. This is just like a fake binary classification. So we will return true or false based on some probability, but nothing special. So uh, first of all, once we trigger the Lambda function, so triggering the Lambda function means that we call the API. So once we trigger the Lambda function, we want to read the parameters. The parameters. So what does this mean? So uh, let's say this is the link of our API. Uh, if we basically do uh, a get, if we make a get request, we can pass these three, these two parameter, parameters to the uh, function that's we have age and country, and then we want to read them. This can be easily done through the event um, variable. Um, then we want to retrieve the model from S3. As I say, this is not doing anything, but potentially this is what we're going to do. We have the rights to do that. And in the end, we read um, the result. So we, the result of the prediction. So we call make prediction. It takes as argument, the model uh, and the two parameters, in this case, age and country. Uh, we think we can think if you're really interested, we can think of this model as I don't know, a model that says if you're going to get married in the next six months. I don't really know. Um, and then basically we have the response of this API. How do we build that? So also this is basically coming from the documentation. We don't really have, this is not rocket science. This is nothing special. We just have to define the body of the response. In this case, the body, the JSON that we send as a response is about one argument, that's prediction. And then we're going to attach the result. So now we have all the components that we need to deploy our application. So we have the definition of the stack. We have the CDK JSON that is mandatory if you want to create a CDK application. 
And then we have our API. So we have the code that we're going to deploy into the Lambda function. And now we can jump to the next step that is deploying. So finally, now that we have all the components of our application, we can just run CDK deploy. If your AWS accounts is uh, properly set up and if you're ready to do all the stuff that you, that you usually used to do with AWS CDK, you can easily deploy your stack, your, your application. So uh, from now on, once you run deploy, you will basically get a really nice summary from CDK that will show you what kind of services and what kind of dependencies you have within your stack. So basically you have an overview of the things that you're going to uh, deploy. Uh, I can't really show you that because I'm using my AWS account. So I'm not really sure if I can actually, I'm afraid that maybe I will somehow spoil some, I don't know, secret links from AWS. So I decided to not to show you the sum summary, but it's really straightforward. So you don't really, um, you don't really have to do any particular actions. You just have to run CDK deploy and um, it's done. So likewise, once you have um, your application deployed, uh, you can just run CDK destroy and get rid of it. That's all. So a few considerations. First of all, in my opinion, infrastructure as a code is already a standard. So I think that this is the, definitely the direction we want to go. So we're moving in that direction. So a lot of developers are, are using it. So it's definitely some, something you should check out, uh, no matter like your background or what kind of job you want to do, just check it out. Um, then I think CDK is a really elegant way to deploy your application. Um, and if you have to decide, unless you don't have like specific constraints, just think of CDK as a first option uh, because it actually, it can really boost like your job somehow, your work. Now, this is also for me, since I'm a, I'm a data scientist, so this is also about data science. So I think that as a data scientist, you can really take care of a lot of data engineering concept by using CDK without administrating anything and without diving, diving into maybe some cloud formation or Terraform complex templates. So I think you can, I mean, having the chance to use Python uh, to define your application, it's a really big thing. And as a data scientist, you really want to add these to your skill set. But of course, we also have some downsides. Probably the first one is that I mean, you have to learn something new. Every time that you, as, you, as I've shown you, I mean, you can have, uh, you actually have to deal with some CDK libraries. So you have to read the documentation, you have to go through some examples. And unfortunately, since this is something readily new, it's not really hard to find the right example for your problem, for, for, for the problem you're going to solve. Uh, so this is a big thing you want to take in account. And most of the time I have to deal with this. Uh, and then in, in the end, I will say cloud formation bugs are also CDK bugs. Uh, we say that CDK is actually based on cloud formation. So if you have something that is not working on cloud formation, you will have the same problem in CDK. And uh, personally, I went through this kind of issues in the past. So just be careful. And yeah, I would like to thank you all, uh, especially PyData for this really nice opportunity. And thanks also Samantha, really nice talk. And uh, please just raise your hand in case you have questions. Thank you, Alessandro. Let's have a round of applause. There are a few questions from the chat. Um, First of all, Dennis was curious about your editor. Which editor are you using and how do you get the doc strings to appear? So now I'm using uh, PyCharm, basically. Um, 
as you can see from here. So this is the PyCharm logo. Uh, I'm using PyCharm and basically uh, from, if you use CDK, since you're using proper Python objects, um, you can basically, yeah, you get the help of uh, PyCharm or IntelliJ, probably uh, Visual Studio 2. Um, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. You, you don't really have to do anything special. And Samantha is curious, what kind of bugs do you run into? So um, one bug that was really annoying, uh, if I remember well, was accessing uh, some S3 um, data. Now, I don't really remember the special use case, but it was about accessing, having the rights to access S3 uh, files. So, to, okay, that was about basically, okay, I had some problems when I had to trigger the Lambda, uh, defining the trigger the Lambda from uh, an S3 bucket, an existing S3 bucket. So basically I was receiving raw data into this S3 bucket and I wanted to build a trigger for Lambda function, but somehow uh, this is a well-known issue. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was actually, having a lot of problems define, trying to define this with CDK. And in the end, I found out that that was, uh, it is a, a cloud formation uh, issue. Um, yeah, so my advice would be, please, if you, if you see that something is not working with CDK, and if you're really sure that you're following the sometimes bad documentation, uh, please check the cloud formation issues on GitHub. Some follow-up questions are coming on the editor. Uh, Dennis also wants to know, do you have preferred sources to debug CDK and object-oriented programming in general? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, Maybe we can read it from the chat. Do you have some preferred sources to debug CDK and object-oriented programming in general? Uh, so, I mean, I use PyCharm and try to debug it with PyCharm, but usually I never had to like, I mean, as a data scientist, I'm not really involved in uh, like de developing or maybe deploying a really big applications. So I didn't run into this kind of problems. Um, yeah, I mean, debugging with PyCharm is usually more than enough for me. Um, yeah. If you have any ideas, maybe I will be happy to, yeah, have a look at it. So Abhishek asks, is there any problem with other IDEs? Probably not, just, uh, would you say PyCharm is a lot better than Jupyter or Spider to work with uh, CDK? Well, the question, so uh, comparing, uh, PyCharm with Jupyter is probably not fair. Um, I mean, I use PyCharm. I use, first of all, I use Jupyter a lot uh, for data analysis, for uh, machine learning. I mean, of course, Jupyter is part of what I do. Um, but of course, when I have to develop the application or when I have to develop some kind of uh, ETL uh, that basically involves building a stack and deploying the stack with CDK, uh, I think PyCharm is the way to go. I don't see how you can really use Jupyter in this case. And you told us um, CDK, just check it out. It's already a standard, it's coming. Um, I'm taking you seriously here, but I'm also wondering, I do occasionally some stuff with uh, AWS, like simple things setting up a workstation with a GPU and Jupyter lab and things like that. Um, I'm wondering when, when does CDK really become useful? Would you recommend that I also do simple things in CDK if I'm comfortable with Python? So um, it really depends. I mean, in general, the short answer pro is probably yes. I mean, just let's have a, you, you can have a look at this um, uh, kind of framework. 
but of course, the long answer is it depends on what you really have to do. Um, if you if you just want to spin up like an instance, an EC2 instance, maybe you don't you don't really have to work with CDK. You can just spin it up and then use it. Uh, but maybe if it's about uh, building, as, as we just saw, like a small inference uh, module uh, that is going to be deployed in production and you want to have like also um, a test environment and a stage environment, uh, I think working through the AWS console from the browser is probably not the right idea, the right thing to do, because then you cannot keep track of everything, anything basically. So you really want to uh, have some versioning under the hood. And maybe CDK, it's, uh, if, if you have to start from scratch, I would say, okay, why you really want to bother yourself with cloud formation? Just let's have a look at CDK. Okay, yeah, thank you. Mm. Is there anything you would like to know from uh, Alessandro and maybe also from Samantha if you've thought of another question to her? Um, not really. Uh, maybe, maybe the only question would be uh, what if she has experience with experience with CDK and if what kind of, as far as understood, bad experience she had with SDK. Yeah, I haven't used CDK. Um, my experiences with SDKs, like I said, they're when they're up to date, they can make your life a lot easier. Um, I have a whole blog post on like using S3 FS, which is a wrapper on top of Bodo 3 um, for like listing S3 buckets and stuff like that. Um, personally, I think the more automation for things that you're gonna do multiple times, the better. I think it's worth it to write the time to, you know, spend the time to write the code to automate things. Um, the trick is it's kind of similar to doing other types of data science that often you do something once and you think, well, this is just a one-off. It's fine if I just do it in a notebook or whatever. And then after you've done it two or three times, you say, you know what, maybe I should write some helper functions. Maybe I should automate this. Um, so I think that's, the same kind of mindset you need to have about all of this stuff. Um, one thing I was gonna say was your comment about the Lambda functions not triggering on files being written into S3, the setup that you were using. Um, Pachyderm actually use, does that use case perfectly. So that's one of the things I liked about using them for deploying models and, and handling all that stuff because they already have functionality that knows how to watch S3 buckets and they have automatic egress. So if you want to, you can just tell it, I wanna write out to S3, here's the path and it handles all that for you. Um, so I think there's a lot of competition right now for what's the right way to handle, how do we wanna serve our machine learning models? And there's a ton of different tools coming out and there's always the option to run it yourself in a cloud function or a Lambda or there, there's several other options for deploying. Um, and I'm really curious to see what's gonna happen in that space because I think right now, data scientists, we're spending a lot of our time on ML ops and having to figure this stuff out. And it's not the best use of our expertise, right? We get to spend like 10% of our time building models and that's the easy part. And then we spend the rest of our time fighting with AWS docs, you know? <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. I know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah that, that, that's a really good point. And this is basically what I went through uh, several times. And uh, yeah, now there is a lot of confusion because we do have a lot of like different choices. Um, I will say in general, infrastructure as a code is definitely the right way to go. But then you always have to choose the framework. So you're always like in the same position, like, okay, God, I know that I have to. Uh, do some work now and have to choose the right framework for my problem. Um, but yeah, let's let's see what is going to happen. But I totally agree with you. Um, and of course, spending uh, time understand, like trying to understand how to use also uh, CDK uh, 
I mean, it's 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 a big deal. It's a big deal. It's not just like looking at some documentation and all, especially when I don't find, and this is what is happening because now it's been a long time that I'm using it, especially when I don't find the right um, example for my problem. Uh, and I know that I have to go through the documentation um, and some sometimes it's really hard because you're like, oh, okay, I have to try out stuff for two days at least. Uh, and, and and of course, I mean, that's that's like, uh, you know, it's like your company's problem then that they're like paying you for this kind of job uh, yeah. because then you have to actually use your time in that way. Yeah. And, uh, and and you also have to, to find the right person that is able to manage this kind of topics. So, yeah, yeah I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and actually, I forgot to mention, we did use Terraform at my last company. Mm -hmm. um, and it is better than trying to manage IAM roles only through the UI, yeah. because then at least you do have a history of what someone's permissions were previously and you can copy roles around more easily. Yeah, exactly. Um, but that also has, there's a little bit of a learning curve that there's different ways to set up the inheritance and the abstractions. Um, and that's changed a lot just the last couple of years Terraform's been under rapid development too. Um, we also used Helm at one of the places I worked for Kubernetes things. That's also its own, <laughs> it's like its own domain specific language that you have to learn this yeah. whole system. So um, yeah, I mean, I think ideally all companies would understand that they need to have a whole ops team just to support data efforts and my experience has been that usually they don't allocate enough headcount for that. Um, yeah, hopefully. The ops team is busy supporting engineering and they kind of data is sort of an afterthought. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, lately it's it's not really common to see DevOps um, open roles. I don't know what is happening exactly. Maybe data scientists are working too much, probably. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to call DevOps anymore. Yeah, I, I still remember like a few years ago when people were really obsessed and into this uh, Zappa. I don't know if you know it. Zappa was like for deploying machine learning stuff. Uh, the name is Zappa and also also SAM was really common from, from AWS. I mean, there was like a time there were so many uh, different frameworks and, uh, and it was always like trying out different things. And, uh, and it was like, okay, I think... Uh, Feels like I'm switching role. Uh, it was really weird, but yeah, let's see what's going to happen. I have a question, Christian, but maybe someone else. So, so there are no more questions from the chat. People comment they like the talks. So, Maria, go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, I think it's... now you're on mute. Now you're mute. <laughs> I I speak alone. Uh, it's for Samantha, but for sure, Alessandro knows a lot, for sure. Uh, the thing is that I listen, I am a newcomer to the cloud topic, and I listened to a talk by IBM. It was a promotion of their services, uh, cloud services. And I must say, I never hear in my life any scandal about IBM. All the big techs, you know, but IBM, you know, so... Um, what they pointed like strongly, or at least is what I got, is that they are the only ones, IBM is the only ones offering a cloud that is hybrid. Like you still have data on your uh, data center and only part of the data are in the cloud if you want. So you don't have to give and sell your soul to Evil, like totally. But then, then in Wikipedia, I look for it and Wikipedia said about Amazon, but I don't find it now, uh, that also Amazon offers that. that. Like you don't have to move the whole data to them. So I want to know what is the truth? <laughs> I think a lot of companies are working on hybrid cloud offerings. And historically, a lot of people had hybrid. Like at Yahoo, we had hybrid because Yahoo had their own infrastructure and we had things in AWS. Um, I think it's more common in some sectors than others. So like in healthcare and in finance, sometimes they're so worried about security that they have everything locally and then they might have a little bit of data in the cloud, but mostly they want to keep things out of the cloud because they're worried about access. 
and that so thank you so much to Clifly this. So then everything you said so far, it will change a lot or it's more or less the same. Like from a pure cloud and a hybrid cloud, things are completely different or more or less easy. Honestly, I, I think they're still mostly pretty separate and it's kind of hard to bridge across. Um, and generally I think when people say hybrid cloud, sometimes they also mean across different platform services. Um, so I, you know, it's a moving target. I'm not really qualified to comment on where the, where that stuff is all going, but um, I, there are also, there's this other whole thing where people are building very large machines and sometimes those make more sense to have your own um, or it might be owned by a different company. So for some types of deep, deep learning, for example, or other types of real time analysis um, that might not be available through a cloud platform. So then you might need to have a hybrid for that reason. But um, yeah, I think there's, there's just a ton of stuff out there and there's a lot of investment. And um, I think depending on what company you end up at, you know, it's worth it to ask these things in interviews. You may be surprised to find out that, for example, they can't let you work remotely because all of their equipment is on site. Um, I think most companies probably are having to work around that because of the pandemic, but there were places that I spoke to even just a year or two ago where they said, you know, we're, we're in healthcare or insurance or whatever, and everyone has to use a key card to get in the building and we don't let you take things home on your laptop at all. So that would be a reason to have your own machines. Felix had another question. Uh, Felix, do you want to ask directly? Yes, a yes, uh, question uh, to Alessandro. Actually, one and a half, uh, two questions. Um, so I really find this uh, serverless uh, Lambda stuff very interesting because it seems to make a lot of things way less complicated. But um, I have like one question is pretty easy. How, like, how is it? Well, no, it's not that easy. Um, I'm not sure either. Is there any way to compare it cost-wise to a more traditional solution? Um, like just having your machine or using SDK or whatever, and how does that comparison go? Like in a comparable case, I, I, it's hard to think up a case in my head right now that you where you actually would have a solution that would be equally practical in both systems but the other question is um it's from from what i see it's a pretty amazony uh thing so don't you um aren't you afraid that all your applications are kind of get kind of locked in into the amazon ecosystem compared to a not serverless solution which you can easily move from server to server for example if you have like containers or whatever you know? okay uh, so, um, answering the first question, so um, I can give you like, I, I, I didn't really compare, um, this is probably already done by the marketing when they sell you the service, so I, I really didn't compare like Lambda, AWS Lambda with um, like another service from, from AWS, like on paper really didn't do this, uh, this, this thing, but I can tell you that uh, like a uh, common scenario where you want to use Lambda instead of uh, an EC2 instance is uh, when you have to, so one example is the one that I've shown you, but in general, when you have to write like a simple ETL, uh, for a simple ETL, you have, um, you don't have a lot of constraints with, Py, uh, with Lambda and usually you have um, a max time, like the time uh, you, can, you can run the, the code in Python, and um, the max amount of memory that are really high, so you can really deal with huge ETL, honestly. Uh, and this is a really cool like case for like that you can use for comparison, because the alternative will be use an EC2 instance and set up the instance. So you have to set up everything and run and basically spin up uh, the instance for ever 
potentially. <laughs> so the, the, it's not really what you want to do, especially if let's say your ETL needs to be executed twice, three, 10 times per day, it's basically nothing. And you really want to go with a serverless solution in this case. And I can also tell you that there are like a lot of companies that are basically dependent on AWS uh, Lambda. So they're basically building all, day serve, all, all their applications on AWS Lambda. Um, and uh, in general, I mean, it's a really good um, way to prototype your application. And then if you need, you can, you can switch to AWS CDK. And uh, now I'm not super familiar with it, but I think, so just don't take it for granted, but I think that you can um, always get uh, somehow download or get this kind of uh, Docker image, I think from, from AWS Lambda, I'm not 100% sure, but in general, uh, I think you can, since it's based on Docker, maybe you can get a Docker image from it, but I'm not really sure, honestly, you can easily Google it. Uh, maybe you can, um, but apart from that, you have a really nice um, Python code that is not dependent from the Lambda function itself. Um, and I think that somehow you can do whatever you want with it. So. In potentially it's really easy to, in my mind, it, it will be really easy to switch to another cloud provider, for instance. And in the best case, you can download it as a Docker image. Not really sure about that, but yeah, maybe you want to check it out. There's no, not another question. It's kind of a meta question. How is that actually like what would be the main difference to good old batch processing as I did it, I don't know, 10 years ago during like at university? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, it's, it reminds me not now that I think more about it. Isn't it actually a pretty old concept? Like, like what's the difference to just standard batch processing on our uh, supercomputer or whatever? Compared to Lambda, you mean? Mm, I honestly, I don't really know, uh, but I mean, in general, maybe Samantha has like more knowledge about that. Um, I mean, I will say, I mean, usually the, the, the advantages on uh, AWS Lambda are, first of all, the auto scaling. So how would you handle that in your case? So how would you handle uh, going from a situation that um, which you have to where, where you have to going from go from uh, I don't know ten requests per day till one thousand. So and this is basically this this is something really expensive that is uh, automatically managed by AWS, for instance. Yeah, I think the scaling is one one thing. Um, there's really there's a lot of differences, but in some ways you can think about streaming as being sort of like running mini batches. Um, so in that sense, it's not that different. But I think the way we've used it in the past, I one thing to keep in mind is that if you're doing traditional ETL in a scheduler like in Airflow. Um, there's tools there that help you tell if how the jobs are connected to each other. And if one upstream step fails, the next one won't be able to run, all that kind of stuff. Um, debugging, if you're chaining a bunch of lambdas together is still pretty hard. So I think lambdas and cloud functions are great if you just have a one step thing you need to do. I think it's very suited to that use case. Um, I would not recommend it. Once you get to the point where you think you need to chain a couple of them together, I would seriously start thinking about moving to something else. Um, but there's really a lot of different options now for streaming. And it depends on whether you need to operate on a row by row basis and get real time data back, or if you can wait for things to accumulate and then run in batch, how long do you need to wait to get enough data Right. It depends. It really depends on whether you're looking to get aggregate statistics or if you want to run a model and 
the requirements for those things can be very different. So there's a raised hand from Oren. Do you want to ask directly? Hello, thank you. Um, thank you for two talks, I enjoyed a lot. Um, I want to ask about the experience of a developer or data scientist or developer that needs to assemble some model from three other models and somehow connect them and uh, debug, test, and a few rounds and at the end pass it to someone else and he will, the other person will find everything that he needs and uh, the parameters that needs to get to the model will, will actually get to the model. And uh, so I, I want to ask, because even without the cloud, we didn't sort it yet, you know, in the company I work at the moment. I wonder how more difficult it is in the cloud or maybe the cloud solves everything or if anything, anyone can talk about it. Do you want to go first, Alessandro, or should I? You can go first. OK. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of new tooling now for helping to track model parameters. Um, and I really strongly recommend, if you're running into these problems, that you start looking into some of these machine learning monitoring tools, um, something like weights and biases, which I've tried recently, Comet, Arise. There's so many, I can't even remember all the names. Um, but they all have the ability to, for you to put your parameters in and have them tracked basically with an SDK. And then you can tell for any given run which parameters ran. Um, it's much easier to keep track in version control of what version <laughs> and how all that stuff is connected to each other. So, sorry, just uh, my, my, my problem is even more basic, not, not the meta parameters of which how did you choose to train the model? The actual parameters that go into the predict, the header of the... So you mean in the code or? Yes, I mean, um, yeah, we had examples before age, uh, country, and someone decide maybe I need another parameter and it's not so enough for about me to. Basically inference using the model. Yes, yes. Uh, during the training, during the prediction uh, and making sure that uh, the model gets what it, what it ex expect because sometimes you pass a, a JSON and maybe the JSON is a little data frame and then, then maybe the columns, the values in the JSON are not the same and things like that. Yeah, I, the meta yeah. parameters are. I, yeah. I use tests for all of that. I, I treat it all like data engineering, just straight up data engineering, the same thing you would do for any ETL that you double check. What are all the things I expected going in? And when it comes back out of each step, check again. Did I get back all the stuff I wanted? Um, I make everything a keyword argument as much as possible. I try to keep everything in pandas for as long as I can because then I have column names and then I only go into a NumPy matrix for the very brief amount of time when I have to strip off the column names and then I map them all back again as soon as I can. Um, that's the only way I found to make it human readable and human debuggable because I personally cannot remember if I've got 30 parameters or whatever that I have to keep track of. Um, and if somebody puts them in the wrong order or you forgot to sort the columns in the data frame or whatever. Yeah, um, and I'd like to add also, as you said, of course you can, um, you really want to stay in pandas as much as you can, because as you just said, you have the columns names. Um, and maybe you really want to test it if you have to use NumPy, but it depends on your problem. So uh, sometimes if you have to build like really big, really big matrix, uh, if you have to build a, re build, build a really, really big matrix in that case, you cannot stay with pandas, you cannot use pandas, and maybe you want to run some tests, uh, but it really depends on what you have to do, what kind of model you're going to use, and uh, yeah, how, how, big is, how big your matrix is, uh, 
Yeah, and also how, how, how much sure, I mean, also it really depends on the code you're going to write. I mean, is it about uh, working with this big matrix uh, for, I don't know, uh, like sending the matrix between several models and then lose any kind of references from all the columns of the matrix. I mean, it really depends on what you, what you want to do. Sometimes it's not a big problem if you can if you can use pandas because you do all the information that you that you want to have from from the regional data set. But yeah, yeah. that you can also do Spark. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, there are the options. Uh, and sorry, and the cloud helps or complicates things. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> it also can simplify things, as Alessandro pointed out. Okay. And I would like to say, I mean, it's somehow it also it's really it's really it's really like bad to keep saying the same thing, but it really depends on the problems. But uh, the main concept for me is. Okay, I will. I, I would like to start. So usually, you you, you really try different like uh, solutions. So I will say you start from the classical one. So you have Python. You have full control of the things that you're doing. You have to run into. You have to run a lot of tests, uh, of course. And then the only scenario I think of, um, like the only, the only scenario where actually cloud the cloud can really helps you. It's probably when you have like a service that works out of the box, like, I don't know, SageMaker or some time series fancy forecasting. Uh, this is probably something like a scenario where I can say, okay, maybe in this case, you don't really, um, you won't run into maybe a lot of problems, but also in that case, in that cases, you have to deal with a lot of constraints because these services usually come with a lot of responsibilities and you do have constraints. It's not just about, okay, I'm gonna use SageMaker, I'm gonna use MC forecasting and it's done. So it's always part of a really big experimentation where you're going to try basic stuff, uh, combine it with fancy cloud services that you think are actually, uh, um, you think that they're going to somehow save you, somehow um, decrease the complexity, but it's not really like that. But Amazon actually does a really good job when they have to uh, sell them to us. So congratulations. <laughs> All right. Shall we take this as closing remarks? Um, thank you very much for the discussion. Um, thank you. People are joining us also from India and now it's 1 a.m. at night in India so <laughs> time to finish um, just very very briefly from the last slide that was the last meetup uh, for pilot Hamburg in uh, this year but we're already in the planning stage for January and there are many ways to stay connected with us and get the latest news about upcoming meetups. Um, follow us on Twitter and follow us on LinkedIn if you like. Um, I want to thank again our two speakers and everybody who participated and everybody who joined us. And uh, I want to wish you a great evening. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>